So we'd like Martin and I would like to welcome you to our very first session of our Humanistic Judaism 101 class. A couple of real quick housekeeping issues. The first thing, of course, is, is that if you're not talking, please use the mute. We'll have a lot of sound issues if we don't. Um, also, just mention the chat is available in class and um, feel free to ask questions there. Um, and, and as we go along, there may be some things that we, 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 we have a look. We may have a lot. We have a lot of things to cover today. So um, even if we can't get to everything, it, having a chat will be helpful. Also, I'll mention Martin and I have talked about this some. And what we would what the initial plan was we were only going to record the first part, the presentation part. But we really think that the class may not be as meaningful people recording and doing the recordings that they only get that part. So what we'd like to do is to record the whole thing. But the presentation part is the only part that be publicly accessible. The second part, the discussion part, would only be for class participants. So I still need to research that a little bit, how's the best way of doing that. But I just wanted to give folks the heads up that we do want to record the second part. But that part would only be for people in the class. And so if you're in a security issue, you have a security issue that you need to be not have your name on screen, uh, you know, when we get to the discussion time, feel free to take your name off of your thing on uh, on Zoom. We totally understand that that's a dynamic for folks. But we also we do know there's several people that have said they can they can't make this time, but really want to participate. So we want to give them the best full experience possible. So. Um, so uh, to after so we, since we got that out of the way, real quick, kind of what our program today is going to look like. Martin and I are each going to give a, an introduction, telling a little bit about ourselves, why we care about the, these topics, why we're teaching this class, and kind of a little bit of our philosophy. And then after that, we'll have some time for conversation as a class of getting to know you. And so we'll be have have that for some time, and then we'll have some time to discuss our syllabus, class expectations, and then to get a little bit of feedback from you all about uh, what you're hoping for from this class. One thing I will mention since it's kind of early on is that we do think you probably will want something, a notebook, or it could be a document on your computer, but we will have a, a spot at the very end where we're gonna ask everyone to take a moment and reflect upon the class, that session, write a few words, doesn't have to be a lot. So I just wanna give folks the heads up now if you need to go grab a notebook or, or open a document in your computer for that later on, that'll be at the end of our time together. So so let's I'm gonna hand it off to Martin to give us his introduction. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh welcome. Uh my name's Martin DiMaggio. My full name is Martin Hassan DiMaggio. Uh, I'm uh, from the UK and I uh, grew up with a British Western Sephardic. Uh, father and a non-Jewish uh, Italian mother. Uh, I grew up uh, actually in the UK reform and liberal movement, uh, which accepts um, uni unilateral parentage. And uh, I began discovering humanistic Judaism when I was about 21 years old, picked up Sh uh, Rabbi Sherwin Wine's book, uh, Judaism Beyond God, and I had thought of myself as a bit of a reconstructionist up until then, and maybe in some ways I still do. Um, and uh, I'm uh, an anthropologist, and my thesis was on Arab Jewish identity. And I'm also a linguist, and I focus on translanguaging practices in endangered and minority languages. And I'm also on the, uh, I'm a student in uh, the international, well, I, I can never remember what it stands for, <laughs> but the international Institute of Secular Humanistic Judaism or something like that. <laughs> um, and I'm in the leadership course there. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm also teaching this class. I may, some of you may recognize me from Spinoza. I very regularly lead services and I think it's been about two years that I've been doing so roughly. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing what humanistic Judaism looks like for myself. Um, me and James have had some discussions uh, around our approaches. You may find me to be slightly more strict in my uh, requirements for uh, tasks between classes, but don't be scared. It's always an, an invitation. Um, I'm coming from a perspective that I would like people to embody some of the um, things that we're talking about through having some experience of what things like 
um, observing Shabbat might mean for you or observing some of the holidays um, and things like that. Um, but don't be put off. <laughs> Having different approaches is uh, part of what it means to be humanistic Jews. And that's all from me for now. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I will mention, I think one thing that Martin and I think both both have a strong uh, belief in is that the idea of of Jewish pluralism, that there is space for different ideas, different approaches, and we're kind of hoping to model that in the class. So we're not completely alike, and that's great. And I gain a lot from Martin and vice versa. And so I think that uh, I think it should be a good class from that standpoint, too. So for myself, uh, my journey is, is that I did not grow up Jewish. I actually grew up as a fundamentalist Christian uh, here in Oklahoma. I, I, by the way, I live here in Oklahoma City in the USA. Uh, and when I was very young, I didn't realize how weird of a tradition that was. But as a teenager and a young adult, I started pushing back. I started asking questions. And that eventually led me towards more moderate understandings of Christianity and finally towards progressive Christianity, particularly in the Mennonite tradition that has this strong emphasis on peace and social justice. That became a big part of my life. Career-wise, by the way, I'm, I'm an attorney and I mostly work with members of the U.S. military who are seeking an early discharge from the military, often for reasons of conscience. And so that's a big part of my life's work is uh, peace and justice issues. And so the Mennonite church was a great fit for me for a long time for that. And really, they became a base of my, supported me in my work because I couldn't do the kind of cases I wanted to do financially without support. Um, but over time, um, and I also became one of the ministers of the congregation. It was a great experience for quite a while. But then a major change happened in my mid-30s. And that is I reconnected with a woman who I'd known when I was very young. And initially, I just thought that she also had left fundamentalism behind, was now a progressive Christian like me. And so we, our relationship really took off. We got married, which also made me a stepfather. She had a son at the time who was five years old. So um, that was a very exciting thing. Something wasn't on my radar screen of getting to be a father, and all of a sudden I was. So that was exciting. But a few months into our marriage, she came out of the closet to me, and she said that, I've actually secretly been studying Judaism and have engaged in Jewish home practices. But my old husband, he didn't like that. So I just kept it completely quiet. But now I want you to know this is a big part of my life and I want to explore it more. And I, at the time, just loved interfaith learning. I loved reading about other religions. So I said, great, a new project. Let's do it. Um, and so we did Rosh Hashanah as a family. We loved it. Before long, that led us to, I think the next thing we did was Sukkot that year. Before long, it's like, well, let's do Shabbat. And before long, we were observing in our own imperfect way, Jewish holidays throughout the year. And it really became a more and more important part of my life. Along the way, though, as I opened up to my church family about that, one person said, James, you're, that's cultural misappropriation. You should not be doing Jewish things if you're not Jewish. And at that point, I realized two things. One was I did not want to quit. Jew I didn't want to quit doing Jewish things. In fact, I realized the Jewish stuff I did at home was maybe more important than what I did on Sundays. And so I said, OK, I, if I don't. But I also don't want to be a be do cultural misappropriation. So I said, I have to become Jewish. And initially, I then when I delved into it, I realized that all of the Jewish movements, but one were expected that someone renounces their old religious tradition to be become Jewish. The one exception was humanistic Judaism. And so I connected with the Society of Humanistic Judaism. I learned from them a lot more clearly that I actually was a humanist. I wasn't yet using that terminology, but I realized that I didn't believe in God in the way other people did. I really emphasized human, what was happening on planet Earth a lot more than anything in, in the hereafter. Um, and I grew into that over time. And so the SH day was my path into Judaism. Initially, though, I the SHJ did a very poor job in those days of uh, connecting with their at-large members. And so I did not continue my membership. I really felt kind of disconnected. I kept doing our Jewish stuff as a family. And then finally, my church situation was I just it wasn't right for me anymore. And I really felt like I wanted to full, more fully commit to Jewish community. So my family and I started attending a reform temple here in our city. Thankfully, our reform rabbi was very open and said, oh, not a problem that you've converted to the humanistic movement. We accept you. Um, and that became a really good thing. 
And then along the way, I also reconnected with humanistic Judaism from the Facebook group um, and also hearing about a job opening for the magazine of becoming their editor. So I applied for the job and I did not get it initially. Someone else got the job. They did two issues and quit. And then, then they came back and said, James, you still want that job? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so that became how I plunged into humanistic Judaism. And eventually that also led to the Spinoza Havra. And um, I really became excited to see humanistic Judaism embodied and particularly in liturgy. Uh, my previous experiences with, with Jewish with humanistic Jewish liturgy, yeah, it's kind of in depth cold about. They didn't work for me. But seeing what our founder uh, William did and also what Martin has done with her liturgy, I really started to see, oh, humanistic liturgy can be powerful and work well. So that's a bit of my my context. I'll also mention, though, that I am very active in the Reform Temple as well as the Spinoza Havra. And I really see them as two sides of the same coin. I love the Reform Movement's liturgy. I like the music. I like the, the emotion and the kavanah, the feel of it. But I like the humanistic side for the intellect, for it being consistent with what I actually believe. I also like where humanistic liturgy is going and evolving into. And I really, I see a lot of power in both traditions. As far as my education goes, um, it's a little bit all over the place. I had one semester of biblical Hebrew when I was in Christian seminary. I had a few rounds of an intro to Judaism class in the Reformed Temple. I've also completed the Darshan program with Darshan Yeshiva, and I'm currently part of the Un Yeshiva's inaugural cohort program, which is the Un Yeshiva is the school that was founded by the Judaism Unbound folks. And I also take some classes with the IISHJ through their officiant program. Uh, no, the main thing I'd say educationally, though, is I'm very committed to self-learning and so listening to podcasts and things like that. As far as my philosophy fee for this class, I will tell you, in fact, I think it's in the syllabus. We have a link to this Judaism Unbound episode from Juan Mejia. And Juan Mejia is a rabbi, conservative rabbi here in Oklahoma City, but he has become a an advocate for conversion, particularly in Latin America, that many people are wanting to become Jewish all throughout Latin America. But unfortunately, many of the existing communities in those countries are hostile towards converts, will not accept converts, unfortunately, in many of these contexts. So Rabbi Juan, he works with folks remotely and then actually travels to different parts of the world to help people to facilitate their conversion into Judaism. And when I heard this episode, that he spoke, he talked about, and then later he and Juan and I actually got to talk later here locally. And he said, what he shared with me, he said, James, Torah is expanding everywhere. The question is, will Judaism, what's going to happen when Torah expands? This idea, the broader sense of Torah, of instruction, teaching, and all that. And I realized that Juan is right and Juan is wrong. What he's wrong about is, is that is, is humanistic Torah expanding? And I, there's many parts of the world where humanistic Torah, humanistic Jewish teachings are not present. And so for me, this class is about specifically wanting to see the expansion of humanistic Jewish ideas, but also to facilitate more people becoming Jewish. Judaism traditionally doesn't proselytize, but I do think for people who want to become Jewish, I want to, to more widely open the doors. I want to facilitate them. I want to help be an usher for them, bring, bringing them into this. Because to me, Judaism is a precious, beautiful thing. And I, not, again, for folks who are happy with where they're at, great. I don't want to change their, their beliefs. But for folks who are not happy, folks who are wanting something that's more real, more authentic for them and speaks to their deepest conditions, I think Judaism has a lot to offer. So um, as far as other things I'd say, educational philosophy is that uh, I really want to emphasize uh, experimenting. Uh, I really like Judaism and Bounds pod, the Judaism and Bound podcast. They talk about the idea of what does it mean to do Judaism in an unbound way, to consider the possibilities. And so I, I think that's a big part of what I want to bring to this, of empowering people, especially to if you're familiar with the Jewish catalog, which is a fascinating bit of Jewish culture. It was it was written in the 19, I think, no, 1970s, and it was from the, the Jewish counterculture. And their whole shtick of their whole book was do-it-yourself Judaism, of experimenting with Judaism. And so that's a lot of what we're going to be doing with our activities and whatnot. So 